people what you do for a living and you say, well, I'm a tap water, doesn't necessarily engender a, a great response. But uh, as we all know, probably one of the more important things that we would want to be involved with. Let's try this again. Um, I'm going to talk today about Southern California's water supply. <clears throat> and I'm going to try to boil it down uh, into uh, a few statements and then kind of go through the process with you. But right now, local water supplies in Southern California are inadequate to meet our demands for water. Okay, probably no surprise to many of you in this room. Um, what makes California somewhat unique, particularly Southern California, is that we have to bring that water hundreds of miles. We actually convey it hundreds of miles just to get down to Southern California. That is something you normally don't see in other uh, water distribution systems for what we have. Uh, why is that? Well, if you look at the state of California that I have there, uh, roughly 75% uh, <clears throat> uh, of the rainfall occurs in the upper third of the state. And of course, the demand is in the lower two-thirds of the state, ergo why we have this uh, conveyance systems that we do have down here. Season and got metropolitan. I had the uh, pleasure of serving for 18 years as the general manager of Cayagas, which is in the northern part of the service area. But you, you can see how it all breaks down. Many of these agencies are wholesale agencies and they retail to smaller agencies or cities. Some agencies are both wholesale and retail, and some are strictly retail. There's a shot of the map of this in the service area. We talk about water supply reliability. Southern California, I, I just not only want to talk about the water, but we want to talk about everything that gets the water to us. Right? Number one, you have to have the supply. Then you have to have the infrastructure to get that supply down here. It's a quite uh, immense infrastructure. And you've got to have the pipes big enough to get the water down here to be sort of like system capacity. You have to have redundancy or flexibility in your system to handle things like emergencies, which I'll talk about in a minute. And of course, you have the uh, facility availability. One of our big features is once we get the water down here, you want to treat that water. And 
and some of the finest treatment facilities are indeed right here in this, in this service area of Los Angeles. Uh, so your water always meets and exceeds uh, federal and state standards. Now, emergency response. Emergency response can be anything from a broken water main to an earthquake. Right? We'll talk a little bit about the earthquake uh, later today and why we are all <clears throat> vulnerable. And the message it tells us to, uh, the message it gives us to proceed more with some of the things like conservation. Okay? Water supply reliability. Let's think about this for a second. <clears throat> We're taking water from Northern California bringing it down to Southern California. And we're trying to enhance those supplies with local groundwater supplies that we're all trying to, trying to develop. But the different aqueduct systems that we have here is the California aqueduct for the state project, Los Angeles aqueduct, because they built their own aqueduct, um, and the Colorado River aqueduct. One of the things that kind of strikes you is, what if I ever had an uh, interruption in any one of those systems? The likelihood of that kind of interruption relatively high considering the hundreds of miles it has to travel. This is a shot of Metropolitan Water District's infrastructure. That's wholesale pipelines, pump stations, reservoirs, treatment plants. This is the Joseph Jensen filtration plant. I think it's right next door to LA's uh, treatment plant. Um, here's another one in the central part of Met Service area. Here's another one. This is just wholesale uh, infrastructure. Now, superimpose on top of that your retail city's infrastructure for pipes, and you realize just how sophisticated your water systems really are. So I take a drop of water off the state project. It takes roughly maybe two, two and a half weeks to get down here. Ends up in a wholesale systems pipeline, like you see here for Metropolitan Water District, and then it'll make it uh, self to a retail systems pipeline, perhaps like LEDWPs, finally to get into your home through your development. And um, all under pressure, water that's treated and water that's safe to drink. And they do it every single day, right? And you always have water. Here's a shot of LA Aqueduct's filtration plant in Los Angeles. Okay. So I want to take just a step back here to 2010. Uh, we were talking about, of course, drought until a couple of days ago. LA Aqueduct on the Eastern Sierras had below normal snowpack. The Colorado River Aqueduct in the 10th year of drought. Okay. Um, local supplies in LA, we had below average rainfall. State Water Project still dealing with fishery conflicts and also drought. That's where we were a year ago in this imported water system brings water to your homes. <clears throat> I just briefly want to talk about, when I talk about drought, for the sake of this discussion, I'm referring to hydrologic drought. It essentially means if this was your average flow, let's say from the Colorado River, anything below average that accumulates uh, would be considered a drought. So a drought has duration, it has a magnitude, and it has a severity, just basically being the area that would be below that, uh, below that midpoint there, below that line. And uh, that's, that's a nonlinear function that can happen. But that's what I mean by hydrologic drought. Agricultural community, we'll talk about soil moisture deficits and things of this nature. But for us, we're just trying to talk about just a lack of the water. Okay. Well, here we are, just about a month ago, February 2011, February 21st, uh, Lake Oroville on the state project, about 74% of normal. San Luis Reservoir, almost full. Um, Lake Mead, still have some problems over there. I'll talk to you about that. And then Diamond Valley Reservoir, that's a terminal reservoir that you all helped build some years ago out there in Riverside County because California is storage deficient. We do not have enough storage um, in California to really <clears throat> help manage our supplies properly. There are a couple of ways to deal with that problem besides going out and developing new reservoirs but it's something that's fundamentally a, a, a problem when you're trying to enhance reliability to a system. Anyway, Diamond Valley, um, about an 800,000 acre foot reservoir, about 85% capacity about a month ago. So I'm sure you hear on the news all the time about the Delta. You know, why is the Delta so important? You know, what's going on that we can't get the water down here that we need? And 
why is that impact me? You know, I'm here at Northridge, or I live close by, and I'm just trying to get by day to day. What is exactly happening? <clears throat> well, you've got a situation where you and I rely on getting our water right out of that delta. Four rivers that feed into the delta, the Sacramento, the Feather, the America, and the Yuba rivers feed into that delta, and we literally have pumps at the other end, and we pull that water right out to bring it down to Southern California. And you can imagine there's going to be conflicts uh, by doing that, and have been uh, for as long as I've been in water, over 25 years. <clears throat> the delta risks, fishery declines with the delta smelt and endangered species. We have a seismic risk for an earthquake. That's literally what, what uh, would worry me the most. Uh, land subsidence in the delta, I don't know if you can appreciate this or not, but this is the pre-delta conditions. And from uh, years and years of farming, you have land subsidence where you're now below, below sea level. And so if you have a seismic event in the delta, we're going to have some issues to deal with. And of course, sea level rise, one of the issues that's been discussed in the next, last few years. <clears throat> so they did some analysis on a maximum credible earthquake in the delta, and they figured it would be about a 6.5 magnitude earthquake. And what happens in that kind of situation, you basically uh, flood the delta with salt water. And when that happens, we're basically out of water. We're having to rely on storage that we have in Southern California where you don't have a lot of. Okay? So our present system that just showed you here was one literally where it comes through the delta and we've got pumps. State Water Project pumps and the Central Valley Project pumps pump that water into the, into the aqueduct and bring it down to Southern California. A judge ruled a few years ago, Judge Wanger, that we couldn't do that anymore for the times of year that we wanted. Let me give you a picture of that. When it's raining a lot, that's when you want to get the water and store it, if you have storage. Uh, but the restrictions that were put on us said, no, you can't do that. In fact, the only times you can bring water down is when your demand is the highest. And so that's, that's a real problem, because how are you going to meet demands and try and store water at the same time? Number one, your pipelines aren't big enough to do it. And number two, you're never going to catch up. So that's a huge, huge problem. So for years, engineers have looked at other ways of bringing down <coughs> water to the, to the area, um, constructing alternative uh, conveyance facilities to go around the delta, such as you see here. And there's even been one to actually tunnel right underneath the delta, which is getting a lot of attention right now. And that's what that dashed line is there. And um, we're talking some major, major facilities there. That's a tunnel boring machine. And they're talking about <clears throat> something that would be on the order of 37-foot diameter pipe, double barrel pipe, to convey water underneath the delta to get it down to, to, down to us. 15,000 cubic feet per second. The problem is uh, the costs are, are very, very high. And of course, like anything else, you're going to have a lot of environmental issues to deal with. And after 25 years in the water business, <clears throat> when I was at Cayagas and at Metropolitan, um, progress has always been slow. Okay? But people still need the water. So what are we doing? What are we doing in the interim to help meet our, help meet our demands? The Colorado River is a whole other enigma. A lot of legal issues on that. That's what this quantification settlement agreement was all about. Basically, a judge said California has to live within its entitlement for Colorado River water. That entitlement is about 4.4 million acre feet a year. About 550,000 acre feet was entitled to your service area, to the Metropolitan Water District. And so there's been a lot of issues on how to get a full aqueduct and maintain a full aqueduct, because that's about only half of what we used to get. Okay. So up into the early 2000s, Secretary of the Interior would always declare a surplus. We could get that water and bring it into Southern California, but those days were over after, the, after this, uh, some of the legal disputes that arose. And so now it's been, what can Metropolitan and you and I do that could actually help us build up those supplies again? And they call those water management actions, which basically are land fouling programs, agreements with other states on how to put water into the aqueduct and store water, and they involve working with uh, Arizona, Nevada, the Imperial Irrigation District, San Diego County Water Authority, canal lining programs, 
and a land fallowing program, which I'll talk about a little bit because that really gets to the heart of trying to do an ag to urban type of water transfer. Literally, they would pay farmers not to plant, not to grow crops, and in return, put the water, leave the water in the aqueduct, and they get paid for that. And on the surface, that doesn't seem like a bad thing. But the things you always have to look out for, of course, well, what are the third party impacts, right? How do you impact that community if you're no longer going to grow crops? Are you going to have some type of economic issues you have to deal with? And so those things all have to be addressed as we try and study these things into the future. 